Some of you know I was raised in Hong Kong, and so when I make trips back to the city to visit my family and spend time with them, one of my favorite things that I've grown to really love and appreciate It's my dad's practice of telling and retelling my brother and I stories about our family's history. Now these are often repeated stories, but they're significant events that have played a key role in who and where we are today, both as individuals and as a family. The stories include my parents' childhoods in India, how they met each other, how they encountered God, what my grandparents, aunts, and uncles were once like, our immigration to Hong Kong, times of joy, moments of failure, and deep pain were often included in those stories. Dad would conclude those stories many times by reminding my brother and I of God's character of ongoing faithfulness and goodness in our lives. We're currently in a sermon series called Don't Forget to Remember, where we are reminded of the truths that we live our lives by. Now these truths are not necessarily brand new. We've heard them, we've practiced them, they've nurtured us and sustained our faith journeys in many ways but for whatever reason, we have forgotten. Scripture calls us to remember, to go back and hold on to those important things, the things that are integral for our lives. That's the case with dad's stories. They're not new. My brother and I have heard many of them many, many times before, but in his retelling, dad is inviting us to remember to remember significant moments, and most importantly, to remember the God who was faithful in all those times. Some of my favorite stories are ones revolving around our immigration to Hong Kong because they remind me of the countless sacrifices that my parents have made on my behalf during a very difficult season of transition. For example, my parents would give up fun nights that they might have planned with their friends to spend time with a very grumpy version of myself. Or they would give up their beds or let me sleep in their rooms because, they, because I couldn't get used to my own bed. Or I refused, just outright refused to sleep in my own room. Now, if you have kids or if you've helped care for kids, you know that sharing a bed with a small child is not the most comfortable thing in the world. Countless sacrifices, difficult decisions where they prioritized my needs over their own, even though they too were navigating a new land, a new people, a new culture through the immigration. My parents' sacrifice reminds me of two important things. The first is their character, and the second is my identity. I am reminded that they are my selfish, sacrificial parents because I am their beloved child. We willingly and even joyfully make sacrifices for those we love. Many of us sitting here today have made such sacrifices for our family, our friends, our loved ones, just for that reason. We love them. As parents, you may have financially sacrificed for your children, for their futures, for their needs above and beyond your own. As friends, you may have made emotional space for those in your close circles, even when it wasn't necessarily the most convenient thing for you. Today, we remember Jesus' sacrifice through the actions and words at communion, which point to Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. When we remember Christ's sacrifice, that he willingly made, we see God's sacrificial character in our identities as his beloved children. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice because we are just that loved. 
So let's start with Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians, where Paul is writing a letter of encouragement and correction to the Corinthian church in the city of Corinth. Now after coming to know Jesus, Paul's calling included caring for the many churches. And so Paul wrote letters to keep in touch with these churches that he was caring for while he was away traveling to other places to bring the story of Jesus, to spread the gospel, the good news. Paul reminds the Corinthian church of Jesus' words and actions during the Last Supper, the Passover meal which Jesus hosts and shares with his disciples before he is taken to be crucified. This is a relevant place for us to start because that's what we are doing together as church, 10th church. We're remembering significant words and actions of Jesus. Paul's letter reminds the Corinthian church and by extension us as we read 1 Corinthians and meditate on it that communion is an integral aspect in the life of the church, an important practice in the life of the church. Repeating Jesus' words, here's what Paul says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul is reminding the church of a key moment in the life and ministry of Jesus, which points to Jesus' coming death, his ultimate sacrifice. Paul is calling the Corinthian church and us today to remember Jesus' sacrifice. But what is Paul actually pointing to? In other words, what was Jesus really doing at this Passover meal with his disciples? Jesus' words and actions during that Passover meal actually point to an older story in Jewish history. The Passover points back to the story of Exodus. There was a time when God's people, the Israelites, were not a people at all. They didn't have an identity as a people. They didn't really even have a full or clear understanding or knowledge of who God was. They had no agency and no freedom. They were Hebrew slaves to the people and land of Egypt. So at the beginning of the book of Exodus, the people cry out and God hears them and he delivers them from the land of Egypt. He rescues them through the leadership of Moses and his brother Aaron. And God performs great miracles to deliver the people of Israel to demonstrate his power to the Egyptian king, to the Egyptian people, and to establish his sovereignty over the Egyptian deities, the false gods and goddesses that they worshipped. As a result, though, the king continued to refuse to obey God and refused to let the Hebrew slaves go. And because of this, there are ten plagues that the Egyptian nation encounters. The last plague brings death to every firstborn in the Egyptian household. In the midst of all this chaos and death, to protect themselves, the Israelites covered the doorposts of their home with animal blood to signal that they were God's people under God's protection. The blood served as a sign, a symbol to demonstrate that a significant sacrifice has taken place. And so the Israelites are saved. There is no death in the Israelite households. And all of these events come together to describe the Passover and it plays a key role in the deliverance of the Hebrew slaves. This is an important event 
in their historical narrative. Once the people are, sla- are freed from their slavery, here's what Moses tells them. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. God commands the people of Israel to remember these events regularly, intentionally, and throughout the generations. To remember God's miraculous faithfulness that led to their deliverance, to their freedom. So when we come back to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians to the church in Corinth, this is what Paul is pointing to when he speaks of Jesus' celebration and Jesus' observance of the Passover meal. Paul is inviting God's people to remember God's faithfulness in a very significant historical moment. And this is what Jesus is doing with his disciples as well at the Passover meal. But Jesus goes above and beyond the Israelite history and the Israelite people. Because when Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it, saying, this is my body given for you, Jesus declares that it's his body that will now serve as a sacrifice, not an animal's. When Jesus takes the cup and he gives it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, Jesus is saying it's now his blood that will be shed, not an animal's. Jesus's body and blood will free all God's people from their slavery to sins. Jesus' body and blood will bring freedom, healing, and forgiveness. The Hebrew slaves in the story of Exodus needed literal freedom from literal slavery. Jesus' body and blood frees us from our sins. Where might you need to experience this freedom? What can Jesus' body and blood free you from today? At the communion table, we are reminded of God's sacrificial nature. This is God's character. He is a God who saves his people again and again. A God who forgives his people again and again. A God who would literally give his body and shed his blood so that his people can be saved. Why? Why did God make such a sacrifice? Because we are dearly loved by him. And this is our identity. This is who we are. We are beloved children of God. A sacrifice needed to be made for a broken people to be in right relationship with a beautiful and holy God. And God loves us and has pursued us to be in relationship with us by giving of himself sacrificially. My dad is a natural storyteller with a bit of a flair for drama, and my friends tease me and tell me I have inherited this flair for drama. But dad consistently started telling me stories about our family's history when I started attending university. And it was because university was a difficult season for me where I was asking a lot of questions about my identity, about who I was. And so I put on a lot of different hats to try and fit in somewhere, to try and belong somewhere. 
In the midst of all this, dad's stories really helped me understand some important aspects of my identity. And stories about my parents' sacrifice just reminded me time and time again that I was always on their hearts. It was comforting, it was assuring, and it was grounding in a moment where things just felt unstable when it came to my identity. I was always on my parents' minds. If I was on their hearts so deeply, how much more on God's? How much more on my heavenly fathers. Christ's sacrifice reminds us that God made the ultimate sacrifice for us because he loves us. He loves us. This is what defines us. We all wear so many hats here. A variety of things define our relationship and a lot of them are wonderful and good and meaningful. For instance, relationships define our identities. Some of us here are parents, we're friends, we're siblings, aunts, uncles. Or when we think about work, those things define our identity as well. We are assistants or dentists or lawyers or doctors, as students, all wonderful and good things. And then there are some identity markers that are painful and really hard, but we carry them. I am what I produce. I am my grade. I am bullied. I'm awkward. I'm not enough. I'm alone. Christ's sacrifice reminds us that at our very foundation, we are beloved children of God. At the communion table, we are reminded that we are fully and freely loved by God. And there is nothing we can or cannot do to change that. There is no accomplishment that we can or cannot achieve to modify or change or add to this reality. In fact, it changes our lives. A couple of moments ago, as we were reflecting on the Hebrew slaves being freed from Egypt, I asked you to consider where might you need deliverance. This truth that we are loved by God has delivered me. It has changed my life. As rich and as beautiful as they are, I come from two cultures that painfully prioritize male children. And for a very long time, as a female firstborn in my family, I felt that I had a lot to prove. But no more, no more. I am fully and dearly beloved by my God. This is what defines me, and so it is for you. No matter what the society, surroundings, work pressures, school responsibilities, or cultures might have to say. In John's gospel, we are reminded that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Gosh, that is good news. To save the world through him. Before the Israelites were saved from Egypt, they had no identity of their own beyond that of slavery. They were not loved. They had been used for hard labor. They were seen and treated as property belonging to the people in the land of Egypt. They had nothing to offer. When they cried out, they cried out because they felt abandoned and God hears them and he rescues them. And when he does that, he forms them into a people. He gives them an identity and he declares this over them. He says about them, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. 
I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. God becomes their identity marker. They are no longer marked by their slavery, by their oppression, or by their past, even though those things remain a part of their stories. We are no longer marked by our sins, by the things that pain us, even though those things are part of our stories. They are not what has the final say. We are marked by God's love for us. At the communion table, we are reminded of God's sacrifice for his beloved people. I took a look at Paul writing a letter at the beginning here to the church in Corinth. And that's what Paul is doing there too for the church. He's reminding them of their identities and who it is that ultimately defines them, the God who ultimately defines them. The image of remembering is an active one. When I actively remember my dad's stories, I'm reminded that I am so loved by my parents. I wouldn't be here today without their sacrifices. When the Israelites actively remembered the Passover, they see a God who rescued them sacrificially, faithfully, lovingly, and miraculously. They see a God who loves them. They would have had absolutely no hope without God's intervention in their history. I love this image of gathering at a table for a meal. We often gather at tables to eat together, we remember, we celebrate, we tell stories, we laugh, we give gifts. Whether that's family dinners that occur weekly or birthdays or maybe Christmas dinners or Easter lunches. When we gather like that, it fills us with hope. It gives us life, it's encouraging. So it is with this communion table. We come together as one body to this table to celebrate, to receive, to be filled, to be uplifted, and to take God's gift that he gives freely to you and to me, the people of God. So as you come to the communion table, I invite you to actively remember. Look to the cross and see a God who loves you so much that he gave his body and shed his blood. A good father who ultimately sacrifices for his children. God rescued the Israelites for a relationship God marked them as his people and he gave of himself to them. God didn't rescue them and then abandon them on their own somewhere to figure it out. We too are invited to enter into a relationship with God, to experience his deep love for us. A sacrifice needs to be made for a sinful and broken people to come into relationship with a holy God, to be in right relationship with a holy God. But God hasn't left us, and he hasn't abandoned us to figure it out on our own. He hasn't done that because Christ has willingly sacrificed of himself because he loves us. In a few moments, we will enter into a time prepare our hearts to receive from the communion table. I invite you to actively remember Christ and his sacrifice. And as you do so, to consider where might you need deliverance? 
Where might you need to experience the truth that you are loved by God no matter what your story may hold? Wherever you are in your relationship with God, in your own faith journeys, come. Encounter the sacrificial God who loves you deeply and dearly. This God who has given of himself and continues to give of himself to us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are a good God, that you are a good Father, and that you have given of yourself freely and fully for us, your children. Thank you so much for your love for us, God. Thank you for sacrificing on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your body and your blood. Thank you for the freedom that we have in and through you. God, as we continue in our worship, as we sing, as we come to the communion table, Holy Spirit, would you touch our hearts to know that our identities are as those children who are so beloved by you, loved by you, and absolutely nothing takes away from that. Thank you, Lord. We pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen.